Miss Angela Gamna Boaji, um, the, the ARC Foundation's executive director and a member of the DV coalition. Um, I would have, I will have my panelists introduce themselves very briefly. They can also tell us what they do and then the organizations and what their expertise is, is on this particular issue. Um, so, um, briefly, you have 30 seconds each, please. So again, my name is Hilda Mensa. I'm a child protection specialist, justice for children and birth registration. And in my work as a justice for children specialist, I very much engage with the domestic violence and victim support unit. And to the broader contest, the Ghana Police Service. Hello everybody, my name is Malonin Asibi. I'm the Acting Executive Secretary of the Domestic Violence Secretariat, Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection. And my function or my role is to coordinate issues of uh, child marriage, gender-based violence, and domestic violence across board. And so I work directly with a lot of partners. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Selina Uzu. And I'm the National Gender Analyst for the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA. And my role involves work with both the Ministry of Gender, the DV Secretariat, the Department of Gender, and I also work mainly with uh, DOFSU. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Melanin, Selena, and Hilda. Well, so can you give us just a some reflections about the topic on hand. We're looking at domestic violence, specifically also within the broader framework of sexual and gender-based violence and the work of the ministry um, over the years regarding these issues. So briefly, within three minutes each, can you give us um, your own reflections about the, this particular area of work of the ministry? Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Um, it's been interesting with the work on with the ministry because um, the ministry was set up as it was she, um, the secretariat was set up in 2008, mainly when the DV Act came up about. We wanted a, a department that will be solely in charge of coordinating and looking at the issues of the dom domestic violence or SGBV in general in Ghana. So, uh, 2008 is about 11 years now. And the DV Act was in 2007, so that is also more than 10 years. The issue now is with the presentation that was done, we saw a lot of activities that had been implemented. But we, I couldn't really sit in there, feel the coordination aspect. Because when you look at the issues in the Act, with the other many policies and laws that have come out of it, the National Policy and Plan of Action, the legislative instrument to the DV Act and all that. There are a lot of issues because there, it, it goes beyond the ministry or the DV secretariat because there are health issues in there, there are justice issues in there, there are policing issues in there. So for, for us not to have the overall perspective, for me it's still a bit challenging because if 10 years down the line, we have survivors out there that want the support, but are we really providing it based on the presentation that we had? Because we saw that many activities had been implemented, but what about the part that health has done? What about the part the survivors that went to the justice system? Do we have statistics on whether they were able to get the needed justice that they, they are supposed to have? So for me, the effective coordination so that we can have what we call the coordinated service for the survivor who is at the center of it all is still missing for me. And I think we need to discuss that. Thank you. I think just, just as we, we did on. with deepening child rights in Ghana, I think Ghana has done well um, enacting the Domestic Violence Act. It's a recognition that we do have a problem with the way that we address gender issues. So that's the first step. Building, um, enacting the relevant legislation to combat gender-based violence. The, like many other laws and policies that we've enacted, the biggest challenge is full implementation. The establishment of the domestic violence unit is also good, it's commendable. But to what extent are they also resourced 
to do their work better. To what extent is the domestic, domestic violence secretariat also resource to do its work? So there's a lot more that needs to be done. The statistics that come out every year are not helpful. And that is a huge area of concern in terms of the numbers of women who continue to experience violence, abuse, and exploitation. So a lot more reflection needs to be done and a lot more action needs to be seen to be to, to targeted at addressing these issues. Yeah. Can we hear from the DOF suit representative, please? And then um, your reflection on the topic at hand before we get inside. Yeah, I'm Joseph Ohine Siedu from DOF suit, National Secretariat. Um, for, for now, DOF suit is um, concerning the issue at stake now. Um, most of the time, all that we know is um, people come to report cases when a crime has been already committed. And then for those to make sure that um, we minimize it, I've given a lot of training to our top hierarchies and uh, most of our Dovsu decks in the various um, districts. As I'm talking now, uh, my people are now at uh, my people are now at Abosi Okai with um, UNFPA trying to sensitize um, the women leaders and uh, um, Muslim leaders in the Zongo communities. Today, we are now um, in Abosi Okai. Um, we are doing this to other schools, especially the basic schools, to make sure that um, um, we alert them and then also uh, sensitize them on how a crime can be committed and how they should also prevent crimes so that we don't have uh, much of that such crimes of um, domestic violence being occurring in our community. Thank well, thank you very much, Mr. Siedu. Um, I, I'll probably have a few hard questions for you, but um, I'll pass it on to Melanin from the DV Secretariat, and then we'll come back when we get into the meat of things. Uh, hello, thank you. You, you were talking about um, how the ministry has fed since the DV has established, uh, have, was established. Yeah, that is true. Um, 10 years back, just as uh, Selena said, you know, when the Secretariat was established and also following up with the policy, the National uh, Domestic Violence Policy, the policy is a 10-year document that is expiring this year. And there were a lot of very key things that should happen or should be implemented from the policy. But what we have realized is that the very major things in the policy are not done. They are not implemented. And talking about the coordination rule, the, the, there's a provision in the policy that talks about coordination from the community level, from the district level, from the regional level and to the national level. And so for the victim to be in the center of attention, this is what should have happened. We should have had coordinating bodies at the communities where these things also happen. And then working, you know, uh, directly with the districts where they could refer some of these issues. And then district also working with the regional and regional working with. So this particular component totally is missing. And that is where the difficulty has come from. And so coordination has been reduced to, if I can say, personal level. Because since I went to DV, I just had to establish my own contacts to be able to refer cases and follow up on cases. And so that has been a very serious uh, challenge. And this, the other one is database. The Secretariat is supposed to, because of its coordination rule, we should have data from the other partners that implement issues on uh, domestic violence, child marriage, and all of that. But that aspect is also missing, and it's a major uh, challenge drawing back the coordination rule of the Secretariat. Thank you very much, Melanin. But before you put your microphone down, I want to find out whether where you sit as the, um, the head of the DV Secretariat, 
For example, I heard a lot on child marriage, child marriage, and I was thinking, what is DV Secretariat doing with child marriage? Child marriage is part of the issue of gender-based violence. Yeah. So why does it separate itself to do child marriage when it has to work on DV and SGBV? That's a, a, a question for you. But within that question is, do you think that your ministry understands the coordinating nature of the DV Secretariat? Do you think? And if they do, why don't they give you the support to coordinate and stop implementing? That's my question. All right. Uh, the first one, you are talking about the issue of child marriage. Actually, child marriage is under the Secretariat, but it doesn't stand on its own. We just implement activities, some specific activities around child marriage, but it is not a body of its own. And then the second part that you just mentioned, well, I, I don't know where to begin from and why the coordination rule has been a problem. But in a way, I think that it is the system. Why am I saying the system? Every now and then we have new people coming to the ministry. And that is coming from the system or the structure. And so each time we have new people who have to come and begin to understand what the agencies are doing. And it's a whole lot of work. And so, and by the time the person may be, begins to understand and to act, that person may not be there. And then you have a new batch coming in. So that aspect has not, even with DV specifically, it, it happened. In several years, it was just like that. The director was removed, another director came, didn't settle. And so that thing also continued for a while. So it makes it difficult for continuity, you know. Yeah, thank you. Good. Uh, anybody wants to reflect on that particular question? Yes, I, I really want to come in there because for me, um, people moving in and out is an issue, all right, but we also need to do better. It's about a structural system. If we know as a ministry what our focus is, what our agenda on combating DV in the country is. It doesn't, because we all move on in, in, in our professional life. So somebody leaves, somebody comes. But when there's a document that is guiding what we are doing, we all are aware of what is to be done. And we, we do the work. So it, for me, it is about the lack of focus. And uh, uh, Madam Maloney is talking about the fact that she came in not long ago. For a long time, there was even the DV uh, secretary itself was not functioning at the ministry. It was virtually replaced by the child marriage uh, unit, which for us is a major issue because if we have a document that we are calling the DV Act with this policy and plan of action legislative instrument outlining the things that need to be done, then we need to focus on it. But I think because of the lack of focus on the fact that this is what we need to do and this is what we want to achieve and this is the way we are going about it. People come with their own agendas and then it curtails what the, uh, we have already on the ground. So it's the structural issue that we have and the focus that we do not place on the issue. For me, that is the major issue and not the attrition rate. Definitely, the attrition rates, it, we will need to talk about it because everybody comes in and starts something new. But the, the challenge is that what is the focus? What is the strategy? And if we have that focus, then people will come in and buy into it. So we really need to have what we want to achieve as a way of, and then the coordination that uh, she was talking about, right from the co community level to the national level, then it needs to run through. But who is looking at what is being done? It is because we do not have the framework as to how it has to be done. The policies are there, we are already talking about. I was happy to hear that we are saying that the national policy and plan of action is going to be, um, updated or reviewed, but have you even assessed its implementation? We ourselves know that the things we put in there, we've not come up with any of uh, the, the, the objectives or the uh, results we wanted to achieve. So is it just about making the policies and not implementing them effectively? For me, that is a challenge. Well, thank you very much, but don't put the mic down, uh, Selena, because I am pretty sure you and FPA, if they are told about this policy, will put money into making the review. How would you make sure that you are not putting money into things that you know will just produce another document? I have a pile of documents that I collected from, from over there. All of it supported by UNICEF, UNFPA, UNIWIA, UNIWIA. <laughs> Why do you keep on letting us produce these documents when we have basic laws and policies? And in fact, these documents are important. 
But would you say no to the secretariat if they come and say, we need to review this document and how we, we won't give you the money? We want you to look at this and that and that. What has been done on the ground? Selena, can you say something? Thank to that? you very much. And I knew, I knew you would put me on the spot. Oh. The, <laughs> the, yes, the point is that um, I know other development partners are here. There are other UN agencies and other development partners. We do not act on our own. We are here to support the agenda and the priorities of the various ministries. It's, it's the government agenda. When we come into the UN, we say that it's the UN government of Ghana support so we do not act on our own we can only advise we can only provide the technical support but the the vision and the policy and whatever the priority setting is from the government so once government thinks that this is what is supposed to be done all we do as, at the technical level is to indicate that for instance we need to assess the, the, the implementation of the plan before we go ahead to uh, enact a new one so that's what we do but the prioritization should come from government and that's why we are saying on this platform or in this forum that we need to have the vision clear and we need to know what we want to do it's not just about the policies even though we do support this implementation is critical because we cannot continue having the documents like you are saying you've been a consultant to many of them but it's implementation we do not just do the laws for doing sick we do them in Ghana other countries pick them and implement them very well and their people are benefiting but for us we, it is just about the talk and about the uh, policy uh, drafting yes so we need to move on at, at not higher and I'm very happy that this forum is here now for us to talk next year when we come we should have specific things that have been done in the area to even measure measuring the, the results is very important that's the MNE aspect and for me that is also lacking on our policy and landscape in Ghana she was talking about statistics we do not have them and you cannot do any effective uh, programming without having the figures or whatever to show that this is where I need to put my foot so a lot of gaps are in the space and we do support all right but the prioritization and the agenda setting should come from government thank, thank you me. so much for mentioning the issue about government prioritization in fact, there's a recent report from the ESA that shows that violence against women, we are not talking even broadly about sexual and gender-based violence, but violence against women and girls in Ghana is costing this country $19 million annually. This country alone. And that data is there. Data from statistics from, from the DOFSU is there. Data from GSS is there. But the ministry has to coordinate the data to inform its practice. That is where my issue is now. Now, let me come to Dosu um, here. We know that we have, for example, if you take uh, maybe 2015 or 2016, you'd find about 15,000 on the average cases reported to Dosu from across the country on sexual and gender based violence. Out of about these 15,000 cases on the average, you have about 1,400 on the average taken to court. And out of about the 1,400 on the average taken to court, you don't have more than 200 successful prosecutions. Why? <laughs> That's a big why. <laughs> um, the one problem that we have is... Um, most victims are not um, able to um, protect the evidence. Uh, we operate according to the law. That's the police operate according to the law. So most of the cases that um, we get, especially um, rape and uh, defilement and uh, other cases, some of them, uh, they don't report early. That's the first place. They don't report early. And before we go into it, they don't have any evidence. It makes it difficult for police to prosecute. We have so many cases that um, we were even discussing some yesterday. That people come to report cases and then, like what some, somebody was saying yesterday, that somebody slapped me. He went to the police station and said, somebody slapped me. And then the policeman, what did you do? Um, Definitely, the police have to find out. They don't just take your um, information and then send it to court. You lose your case. So we have to back up uh, the case with the evidence. And most of the cases don't have evidence. People don't know uh, um, what to do when a, a crime has been committed to them. And they, for that matter, they don't protect the evidence. 
So it makes it difficult for police to prosecute. That is why we are not being able to prosecute. And most of the time you see that we send the cases to court and then we lose. That's an interesting one. But let me stay on you a little bit, Mr. C. Edu, because I know you do a good job, but Obrek, you know, um, if, if I come to report to you that I've been slapped about by my spouse, yeah. and you ask me, what did you do? Do you, do you really want to do something about that case? It means you are asking me, uh, what did I do to, uh, for the justification of the slaps? Eh? Not really looking for evidence. So do you think what did you do is the question that you should ask? Or, you know, how did it come about? You know, uh, is the questioning part of the reason why we are getting the results you are seeing? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, a woman comes to the station and report that... Um, my husband has been beating me. Um, definitely, we will take the case. And then you interrogate the person. What happened? I didn't do, I didn't do anything. And he beats you. He said, yes. Oh, is he becoming crazy? No, my husband is not crazy. You, you need to get all this information before you can go ahead with your, your, your case. You don't just take the uh, one side of the story and send it to court. Uh -huh. So, uh, that's, that's the... Uh, your way of interrogating, eh? Interrogating. Okay, but I hope you... Yes. Hilda, you may want to make a comment on that and then Selena? <laughs> that's a big why. <laughs> um, the one problem that we have is um, most victims are not um, able to um, protect the evidence. Uh, we operate according to the law. That's the police operate according to the law. So, most of the cases that um, we get, especially um, rape and uh, defilement and uh, other cases, some of them, uh, they don't report early. That's the first place. They don't report early. And before we go into it, they don't have any evidence. It makes it difficult for police to prosecute. We have so many cases that um, we were even discussing some yesterday. That people come to report cases and then, like what some, somebody was saying yesterday, that somebody slapped me. He went to the police station and said, somebody slapped me. And then the policeman, what did you do? Um, definitely the police have to find out. They don't just take your um, information and then send it to court. You lose your case. So we have to back up. Uh, the case with the evidence and most of the cases don't have evidence people don't know uh, um, what to do when a, a crime has been committed to them and they, for that matter they don't protect the evidence so it makes it difficult for police to prosecute that is why we are not being able to prosecute and most of the time you see that we send the cases to court and then we lose that's an interesting one but let me stay on you a little bit Mr. C. Edu, because I know you do a good job but Obrek you know um, if, if I come to report to you that I've been slapped about by my spouse, yeah. and you ask me, what did you do? Do you, do you really want to do something about that case? It means you are asking me, uh, what did I do to, uh, for the justification of the slaps? Eh? Not really looking for evidence. So do you think, what did you do is the question that you should ask? Or, you know, how did it come about? You know, is the questioning part of the reason why we are getting the results you are seeing? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, a woman comes to the station and report that um, my husband has been beating me. Um, definitely, we will take the case, and then you interrogate the person. What happened? I didn't do. I didn't do anything. And he beats you. He said yes. Oh, is he becoming crazy? No, my husband is not crazy. You, you need to get all this information before you can go ahead with your, your, your case. You don't just take the uh, one side of the story and send it to court. Uh -huh. So, uh, that's, that's the... Uh, your way of interrogating, eh? Interrogating. Okay, but I hope you... Yes. Hilda, you may want to make a comment on that and then Selena. The COD is really on the hot seat. But the point is that these are some of the capacity gaps we also have. Because it, it is because we are not 
I keep coming to the issue is we are not having the focus or the strategy as to how to do this because if we are doing that and we are putting our resources where our mouth is, a lot of this training will be ongoing. Strategies and, um, and, and, and um, policies or whatever that is needed to train the police, train people that deal with domestic violence or sexual and gender-based violence will be done. There should be frameworks as to how, when you get a case of SGB, it should, it should be uh, uh, handled. All that case management and handling, ha people that work in the area have to be always oriented on it. But there is a big gap because the, we, are, we are doing things on ad hoc basis. That's our challenge because people will be transferred from here to there and then they, they are caught uh, in the web. They are found wanting. They do not know what to do because the questions that have been asked, if you go into the law or into the policies, the way you are to handle SGBV cases are outlined. But people are moved from maybe um, another level to, to yeah, another unit to uh, the DOVSU unit without the orientation. And government does not support their their training. A lot of the training or support is coming from UNFPA, is coming from UNICEF, is coming from IOM. Developing partners can go only a little while based on our mandate areas. But the overall framework and structure, how are they even coordinating between DV Secretariat and DOFSU? For me, that is a major challenge. Madam uh, Maloney was talking about the fact that Madam Bobo should have been here to present the statistics. But as the overall body in the country, she should be having that statistics. Because those two should be having a link to the DV secretariat. These missing gaps are a major issue. And then we are getting a backlash from the survivors because we are doing a lot of sensitization for them to know that you have these rights when these things happen. Do this and that. They go and then they face the, back, the, the, the lack of services. And then people are now telling you that you come and tell us this. We go, we don't get the services. Sometimes when you go into some of the communities, people will leave if you want to sort of attack you because the services are not being provided and it's a major issue. So please, government partners here, we really need to up our game. Thank you, Salina. I think uh, you, you've hit the nail right on the head, but let me come to Hilda and then get back to Melanin okay. on that. My timekeeper, make um, sure that you signal me when it's time to do the questions. Okay. So I think that um, the protection of evidence is one of the issues that prevent um, prosecution of the cases. We supported judicial service to undertake a research into children before the courts. And interviewing even some of the children themselves and parents whose children have been victims of abuse, you would realize that for majority of persons who are um, sexually abused, quite a number of them do not have the requisite resources to seek medical attention on time. And research has also revealed that quite about 90% of the perpetrators are often people who are very close to us. And because the people are close to us, or most often from the families, there is a reluctance to report. And when they do get reported, some of them feel that that becomes a source of embarrassment to the family. And so perpetrators often would go bribing the family, who themselves are challenge, have challenged with resources, what to eat in a day. And so the perpetrator comes around to say, take the 2,000 CDs and don't appear in court. And so a victim goes to court one time, and the second time she's not there anymore. That is a problem. And part of the reason why UNICEF also supported the judicial service to establish the child-friendly court, because another realization is that sexual abuse cases is often traumatizing to repeatedly tell the story in court or in any other arena. And when they have to say the story over and over again, that is traumatizing. And so they don't come again. And that is why the child-friendly court put in, in place a system that prevents the victim from having direct contact with the accused persons once the case is in court. And it's a way of encouraging the victim and providing support to the victim and the requisite psychosocial support to say that, look, it was not your fault that this happened. You will need to provide us with certain evidence for us to be able to prosecute the case in a manner that serves as a deterrence to others. And so that is also something in place. But on a broader scale, we Hilda, need to are you sure it is change. in place? When you say in place, do you mean Accra or Ghana or North or South? 
or which the court I went to the last time, is it in place? So, Angela, I challenge you to visit Circuit Court 5. That is just one region. Ah, nice. But in, other, court in five. all other region, mm -hmm. in all other region now, at least there's one thing, one child friendly court that I can also challenge you to yeah. check. No, don't you don't need to challenge me. <laughs> I, I want you to be specific when yeah. you say it's in place, it is because it gives the, the impression that it's across the country. It is across the country. Okay, how many courts? At least 10. 10 courts, 10 courts now, Agenda 39, 39 yes. million, 10 courts, child friendly. Angela, at least let's congratulate ourselves because it's a journey we have embarked on. We how many years ago? At once. The first child friendly court was launched 4th December, right. 2018. Okay. So that is a big step to take, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to leverage on that. The question for me will be for us to assess the nature of cases that these courts are handling and whether that is encouraging and compare it with the previous when these courts were not in existence and then make a case for replication. And so it's a journey, gradually we'll get there. Sustainability? We need, we need. Who is going to take care of those courts to see whether they're doing it? And they'll continue and we'll come back five years when you have moved on I, I would, I to would, the UN age you and you are no longer there. Not, what will happen? I would, not, I would not want you to be pessimistic. Oh, I'm not. Because I'm while we were supporting the establishment of the court, we also took into consideration the sustainability of the court. So it's, 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 what is, the question will be what is there that requires resources to maintain. Okay. The, the logistics we've put in place, we built in already the persons who built it to ensure that there's continuous maintenance of the equipment. The people we are training to serve as support persons have the knowledge and the skills. Okay, All my right. question would and be- the institutions themselves- The institution, has it picked it up in such a way that in five years, we won't come to this summit and, and you know, speak as though we are starting again and who is watching over the institutions so that they will do what they say they will do you get my question that, that is a question but also we we do the unicef didn't do the court so talina you and i know that we are human agencies and like you rightly said we support the institutions and what i rightly said was we have supported the judicial service to put in place that system the, the, the circuit court five had been a circuit court five all this while. Mm. Making it gender friendly and child friendly is the difference, mm -hmm. right? So UNICEF didn't do that because the court, we didn't even build the court. We can't build the court mm -hmm. because we don't do bricks and mortar. Yeah. But what we are doing is that we need to strengthen the system that provides services for children. Yeah. And part of strengthening the system is ensuring that the institutions put in place a mechanism that recognizes that a child is in court and that that child is a vulnerable child and that child has been traumatized, that child has been abused. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we as an institution, our services should not further deepen the trauma of that child. Absolutely. And that is why that child-friendly system is only to aid the process and ensure that the child is not further traumatized. Right. When the Chief Justice inaugurated the court, she had even said that from now on as an institution, let's begin to budget to sustain the court. That She didn't even say that UNICEF to support. And I thought that was complete ownership of the process. Okay. You know, well, that's and nice to know. It is, it is indeed true that we are having challenges as a country. But once we begin these steps, let's be encouraged and let's support it. Civil society as, an, as a group also have a responsibility to hold government accountable mm -hmm. and also to contribute to making things a bit better. And so asking the question about who is supervising them, I will throw it back to the civil society organization. Are you also watching and holding our institutions accountable and therefore asking the necessary question? And therefore the, the money you also mobilize, you ensure that it's contribute to deepening the rights of people in Ghana. Those are the questions I would ask. Because essentially when it comes to accountability and watching over the gatekeeping mechanism, that's why we have civil society organizations. And I would I, encourage yeah. them to do more on that. Right, Hilda. I, and I love that you said that because the accountability process is I think what is missing in this conversation. And that has always been my concern that when, from, from when we started having these conversations, we have had Save the Children, uh, UNICEF, uh, UNFPA, and it's been year upon year upon year. Now, the question for me has always been, what will happen if UNICEF decides that now we want to go somewhere else? It appears that our state institutions 
do not actually continue with whatever it was that somebody initiated. And so that question is key for me because we'll come back three years as though nothing happened. And that's the question I was asking about. So let me, let me, I'm wrapping up on this and I'll, I'll give it to Melanin. Two quick questions. The Domestic Violence Act um, asks that we have a, um, a fund and we know that was established. But it also asks that the fund be audited. And every year there must be annual accounts. I want to know the status of the fund, the reporting, and the auditing. That's one of the questions. And then finally, your, we'll talk about your, what you think we should go, do going forward. OK, thank you. Yeah, I'm not aware of um, any reporting that has been done formally to Parliament. I haven't seen a document like that since I went to DV. And since I also went, I haven't done any reporting of that nature. But the fund, as we have always talked about, is, is not very active. Because the money that has been there since the seed money put by government has been the same. Ideally, according to the Act, government has the responsibility to first, every year, through Parliament, put some allocation of the budget into that fund. And then other uh, bodies can contribute, including individuals. And so that has been, the, the fund has been dormant, it has been very static, and so we've not been able to use it to support uh, the activities for which that fund is set up for. And then your second question, you were asking, oh, I was trying to be the hatchet. Um, can we have questions from Dan? Prosecution. They need more protection and care than prosecution. For Thank instance, you. Madam Chairman, let me use this case as an example. Yeah. We recently rescued, recently, I should say, in, in, we invited, we brought a girl who was alleged to have uh, stolen a two month old baby girl. It was even in the news from uh, Mankesim. Now, we realized that we, with support from social welfare, officers, we did the background check, the social inquiry, and realized that even the mother or the, the parents are even the organ victims. The parents even need more support than even the, 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 the child herself. So in that case, we did not prosecute the child. What that we was no, we are using, the child becomes an involuntary agent. The child was used to commit that offense. So what we did was we used the child to to get those behind the dog and then got them arrested and then we are so thank uh, you uh, thank I you would so advise much. that let us all collaborate cooperate we can't all collaborate if the head that needs yes. to collaborate makes yes. us collaborate and yes what we are prepared we are ready right. exactly. yes. we are ready yes we are ready to collaborate wonderful thank you so much that's the whole point that's the way the law is actually written too and that coordination is so important can we have two more questions we have just a few minutes. Yes, um, sir. And who else will ask a question? And those will be the two for this session. Is there any other questioner? All right. Yes, sir. OK, thank you. I have two short questions. Number one, how will you answer somebody who will say that postmodernity is what is giving us all these problems? Because we have a worldview of A, B, C, and that is why we are talking about all that we are saying. And two. Is our culture or religion a promoter or a hindrance to reducing gender uh, violence in our society? Thank you, sir, but don't sit down. If you say postmodernity to someone, even me, I don't understand it. I don't see how the rest of our please. What is postmodernity? From in the two 50s seconds. to uh, the 1950s onwards, people are telling us that so many things have changed and what have you. So people are thinking differently and bringing in so many other things. And that is what is influencing how people are behaving and reacting and things of that nature. Part of it is what we are wearing as a worldview. So when we are talking about these things, then it means that you are seeing it from a spectacle that is not making you see it as a Ghanaian. Okay, in that thank case, what you. do you say to that? Postmodernity. Yes, final question, and then we are gone. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question goes to Melanie. What I want to ask her is that 
Now that she's identified that coordination is an issue, what's the roadmap and the implementation plan? The second one is also sometimes civil society needs to be getting involved because some of these policies, when they are able to implement, is civil society that will participate in most of these things. I think that stakeholders information and meetings and also awareness is very important, i.e. schools has to be aware of it. There has to be a counsellor section elsewhere. You have counsellors, they have posters and other things that create awareness. Are you abused? You go to the counsellor, speak to them. I want to know the roadmap, um, the Ministry of Gender and Social Welfare, Children's Social Protection are doing. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I think it's a global village now we are all living in, right? So there's no question about postmodernity. There are things that are happening worldwide, but that they're also happening in our country. And so what is the global practice in addressing those concerns? And we need to take a cue and best practices from elsewhere and, and domesticate it. And so we cannot say that postmodernity is the cause of our problems because we are moving forward. 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago, we're not using mobile phones. Today we are using mobile phones. Was that a problem? Is that a problem? It's not. And so if mobile phones are not a problem, then all other issues should not be a problem of postmodernity. The question is how do we address it in a way that makes our society conducive for all of us? Thank you for the question. Let me tackle it from this aspect. You talked about posters and the creation of awareness. And I can assure you that as for that aspect, the ministry has done a lot of work on, and that is why if you heard what Dr. Abwaji was saying, she said that yes, the awareness is created. People are aware of these issues. They know that if something like this happens to me, it is an abuse. But then coming back to Selena, the issue of the essential package of services is what is missing. You also talked about road map. Uh, to be frank with you, I, I cannot give you a straightforward road map as we sit. But that is the essence of this meeting. That is why we are deliberating, to see the way forward after this. And so with all these comments that are coming, and the fact that we have to review the policy, which I talked about and said that the major thing of coordination from community to national was missing. We will look at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really like the intervention that was done by the head of the Human Trafficking Unit. Because for me, that is all the, 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 the whole system. It's like the lack of the coordinated or integrated or essential services for the survivors. And when uh, Social Welfare did their presentation, for instance, I had a question. How are they even linked to the DV Secretariat for the implementation of some of the uh, uh, policies or strategies in the DV Act? Because when you go into most of the communities, like you were saying, counseling, social services, uh, policing services, it has to come from the other aspects. So for us, I, uh, Madam Maloney is promising us, and it, it's very good that we have this platform. The roadmap is essential. It is very, 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 very critical because um, the lady has given us the word. If you have your roadmap, then you know that this is the way I'm going about it. Most of the time, when I get the opportunity, I don't talk about UNFPA doing this or UNFPA doing that because for us, it's not us, it's the government, it's the ministry. So uh, when we are supporting and we know that this is the roadmap that we've supported for us to be able to combat domestic violence, then we are all feeding into it. So um, Madam Maloney, please, the roadmap. I, I will echo what my sister was saying. We really need that roadmap. Thank you. Yeah, and I would like to talk about our tradition and culture, um, which is also um, part of the problem. You know, um, in Europe and other places, when you are talking to an elderly person or anybody at all, they watch the face. You look at him at the face. But here in our country, especially Ghana here, and I don't want to say Africa, in Ghana here, or you don't talk to an elderly person and watch the face. You say, oh, we are before Bonnie. So um, most crimes have been committed and then nobody is um, able to describe the fellow. You ask and then, oh, what happened? Nobody, even 
uh, it's not the public alone. Even we, the police officers, too. Sometimes um, a crime is committed and you answer then, oh, were you not there? He was there, but um, was not uh, able to describe the person. Now, um, a law like um, marital rape uh, is difficult to pass because um, you, you don't go and tell your mother that my husband has raped me. Um, according to our tradition, will be good if you So, um, these are some some part of the tradition that um, hinders from um, being able to um, uh, uh, be, being able to detect crime. Thank you. That issue has come. This is the roadmap. It's right here. In this document, it was fashioned in such a way that almost everything that needs to be done is in here. The National Policy and Plan of Action. We don't need to go seeking for the roadmap anywhere. The most important thing is something that I remember from a, a line in the Bible where a prophet asked a poor woman, woman, what do you have in the house? The woman was thinking about it, but she had something in the house. We have a scattered community resources. Every district has shrugged. Every district has social welfare. There's some one NGO, whether they are poor or not, they are there. There are teachers. There are queen mothers. There are uh, community leaders. There are all of these th people in our communities, our districts, our regions, and in our nation. All we need is for somebody to say, come along and let's go. That is it. That is the work of the ministry of gender through its domestic violence secretariat and its board. If they don't bring us along, all these community resources which we have in the house, with or without donors, are there to be used. And you also have internal resources to apply. In this roadmap, there are many things that do not need money. I still keep insisting. The money bit is there. Some things are here you don't need money to do. We will appeal to our gender ministry to look at this document again alongside with the laws. Pick out the things that you don't need money to do. Get us alongside. We are all in the wings waiting for somebody to coordinate and lead us so we can go forward with this. Thank you very much.